Well, good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. We're so delighted to welcome you and uh, so grateful that you have uh, chosen to be a part of this Wednesday night Bible study. Tonight, we're going to be looking at Psalm 89. Today is November the 3rd, and uh, I can't believe that we're just uh, less than a couple of months away from Christmas. Uh, but if you have children, you are well aware that Christmas is not that far away. Uh, but anyway, thank you for being a part of our Wednesday evening Bible study. I hope that you'll grab a Bible and look with us tonight. We're going to be looking at Psalm 89. It's a rather long psalm, so I'm just going to kind of give you a, a brief overview of what the psalm is actually like, and uh, we may actually come back and work through each individual part. It is a beautiful psalm, and it is a psalm if, uh, if you seem to have uh, found yourself struggling with God making promises and yet things not working out the way that you understand the promise to be. Uh, so it's, it's one of those psalms. It's a wonderful psalm, and it's a great opportunity for us to look at uh, some of the ways of God. Before we get into the psalm, I want us to spend just a few minutes in prayer. I know that many of you have burdens on your heart. Many of you are you know, still concerned about the issue of the coronavirus, and many of you are struggling with issues that have risen because of the coronavirus. Some have uh, just their health has been broken severely. Uh, some have lost loved ones because of the virus. Uh, others have had the virus and no effect whatsoever. And still others are somewhat uh, <laughs> hesitant about anything to do with the virus. They are rejecting the vaccine. I mean, people are just everywhere you can imagine uh, when it comes to the virus. And because of all the opinions, uh, you know, it's just one more uh, thread in the tapestry that makes up this great world of ours in that uh, causing more and more division. And uh, it's, a, it's a troublesome time. But anyway, other than the virus, I know that many of you have loved ones that have been sick and in the hospital. Some of you have loved ones that are sick and facing difficult days in the days to come. And so I pray that uh, you'll just uh, lift those up to God during these moments of our prayer. But let's pray together, and then we'll dive into Psalm 89. Father, thank you for being our God. And as we come before you in a time of prayer, I know that there are many who have prayer concerns that uh, for whatever reason, they, uh, they're just struggling with issues in their life, whether it's issues of their health, issues of family. Uh, some have issues dealing with finances. Uh, and Father, just, uh, some are just struggling with the very fiber of life itself. So I pray that you'll be with each and every one. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to cry out to you and to come into your presence. And tonight I pray as we just briefly look at Psalm 89 uh, that you'll help us to gain some understanding of what is actually taking place and how sometimes life can twist and turn in ways that we uh, simply don't understand. But I pray, Father, you'll help us as always to put our trust in you regardless of what we see regardless of how we understand what's taking place. Help us to understand that you are always there for us and that we need to cast our cares on you. Thank you for uh, this time together, and I pray now your blessings. Be with us as we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, I guess telemarketers don't even realize when you're having Bible study. Well, tonight is Psalm 89. It is a miscale of Ethan the Ezraite, and you remember that Psalm 89 was a psalm that was written by, uh, or written for, an Ezraite, and Psalm 89 joins in that same family of psalms. Now, it is a long psalm, and first 52 verses long, and it deals with a lament, 
there were all kinds of promises made to uh, the, the rule of David. The, matter of fact, the Davidic covenant comes out of uh, that period of history. And, and God made some great promises to David in that he would never uh, turn away from David. And yet there came a time when uh, the kingdom of David suffered uh, some great, uh, difficult, dis difficult days, uh, a disruption in everything that the people of God understood pertaining to the covenant that God had made with David. And so the people didn't know what to do. Uh, but it starts out, it is a beautiful psalm in that it really opens up praise and adoration for who God is. And then it talks about the covenant that God made with David and even it explains how God would never turn away from David. Uh, and, of course, we understand as Christians that God never did turn away from David. Matter of fact, if you remember from your Christmas story, which is not that far off into the future, uh, when you read about the birth of Jesus, it talks about how he was from the house and lineage of David. And all through the ministry of Jesus, we have references to the fact that he is a king in the line of David. And so David, God is fulfilling all the covenant he made with David, uh, but when there are disruptions <coughs> in life, we tend to wonder what is going on. <coughs> but anyway, the psalm is divided up into three parts. Uh, verses 1 through 18 really is just a section where it is praising God. Uh, part number 2 begins in verse 19 and runs down through verse 37. And it is about the covenant that God made with David himself. And it was a covenant where God said, I'll never turn away from you. I'll always love you. <clears throat> You'll always be the objects of my love. And yet when we get to verse 38 we find that there is this unfortunate event that has taken place, <clears throat> and it is referred to just simply as an event because nobody really knows exactly when or which disruption in the line of David this actually took place. There were many, and a lot of things could be referred to here. But basically, the psalm is about how do we deal with the promises of God <clears throat> when it seems as though everything we understand about the promises of God really don't seem to be holding up. If you read the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter is written to people who are suffering and uh, they don't understand their suffering. But Peter is writing to make sure that if we're suffering, we suffer for doing the right thing and never suffer, we never make sure that the suffering is justification of God uh, for the difficulties we go through. Make sure you're always doing the right thing, and even when you're suffering, keep doing the right thing. Don't, don't ever turn and uh, think, well, I'm having a difficult time. I need to do something different. No, always keep your trust in God, uh, regardless of how difficult things may be. Well, let me get into uh, Psalm 89. <clears throat> and here again, probably will not cover all of the psalm, but I would like to look at some of the high points as we go along. So let's just dive in. Verse number one, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. Uh, with my mouth, I'll make your faithfulness known through all generations. Uh, the psalmist is making a confession here. I'm going to use my mouth to sing your praises. And I'm not just going to sing your praises in front of my family. <clears throat> I love to hear stories of little children and how moms and dads are trying to instill in their heart uh, all the things of the faith and how they do it as little children. And, uh, you know, it just becomes a part of the fiber of who those children are. I love to hear those stories, but that's not what the psalmist is doing. He's not saying, I'm going to sing your praises in my little family unit. No, he's saying, I'm going to sing your praises to everyone I know, not just this generation, but the next generation. I'm going to get out there and let people know that I am a follower. I am a believer in Almighty God. Look at verse number two. I will declare 
that your love stands firm forever, that you establish your faithfulness in heaven itself. And then verse 3, he introduces us to the fact that this is a psalm uh, talking about the covenant that God made with David. Verse number 3, you said, I have made a covenant with David, my chosen one. I sworn to David, my servant. I established your line forever, and I made your throne firm through all generations. And then in verse 5, he starts uh, singing and talking about the praises uh, that he wants to sing to God. And uh, it is a beautiful, uh, this is such a beautiful, uh, I mean, it just takes us to new places when he ta starts talking about all the reasons we have to praise God. But notice verse 5. The heavens praise, praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies above can compare with you? He begins asking the question, and he's actually going to get pretty specific uh, with even angels. Who can compare to God? And really, he starts up in the heavens. Who in all the skies can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? I mean, you know, we have gone through periods of time where we talked about the wonders of angels, but even angels, as, as much as they grab our attention and as much as they're beautiful, uh, you know, even in the Christmas story, angels are such a part of that story. And on Christmas trees, uh, you have uh, angels that are hung on the Christmas tree, and they're very beautiful. But there, there is no angel uh, that even compares with, with God. Who in the council of the holy ones is greatly feared? Uh, he is more awesome than all who surround him. All of the angels that surrounding God. God stands more awesome than, than they could ever imagine. You are mighty, O Lord, and your faithfulness surrounds you. Your faithfulness surrounds you. Uh, you rule over the surging sea. Now he's getting into creation. And he's talking about uh, the surging sea. The surging sea is one of the things that just literally scares man to death. Uh, there is a place in the Old Testament in the book of Ezekiel where it talks about Tyre and some of the ships of Tyre and how they've taken to the seas. Uh, but God sent <laughs> storms. And as those storms rocked those ships... Uh, so uh, sailors were just scared to death of the sea. Men who'd made their life uh, on the seas were horrified because of the sea. And so the sea can be this powerful force in the life of men. Even men who have given their lives to working on the seas, uh, it can be a terrifying thing. And that's exactly what the psalmist is referring to. Let me drop down to verse number 11. The heavens are yours. And yours also the earth. He's referring to all of creation. You founded the world and all that is in it. You created the north and the south. Tabor and Hermon sing for joy at your name. Now these would have been mountain ranges in uh, the Near East. And, and uh, he's talking about how beautiful they were. How captivating uh, they would have been. And it's when you stand and look at these beautiful mountain ranges. It's as though they themselves are lifting up their voice uh, to sing praises to God. The Bible says all of creation sings the praises of God, and that's what he is referring to here, is that, uh, you know, these beautiful mountain ranges seem to be singing the praises of God as well. Verse number 14, let me drop on down. Righteousness and justice are the foundations of your throne. Love and faithfulness go out before you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence. Now, people who have learned to uh, look around and people who are, are just a part of what God is doing and are aware of how wonderful God is, uh, they can't help but to sing praises to God. And he's saying in verse number 15, uh, those who know how to praise God just based on who he is. 
And based on all that he has done, as you look around at all creation, uh, they're just a blessed people. Uh, now, there are a lot of people who get mad about this and upset about that. They get disappointed here. And the next thing you know, they're no longer praising God. And when that happens, you can just see in their life there is something missing. I've been in Huntsville for a good part of the day, and as I was coming home, I stopped to get me a drink and use the restroom. And uh, when I walked in the little convenience store, a uh, girl behind the desk said, hey, you know, it was kind of a greeting, uh, but it wasn't a real exciting greeting. And I said, man, you just look like you're having a wonderful day. And she didn't say much. And I said, today is a wonderful day. And she said, well, I'm trying to make it one. But, you know, a lot of people just do not enjoy uh, every day. And I confess, there's times that, that I wake up in a grumpy mood or don't feel well. Uh, but every day is a reason for us to praise God. And that's what the psalmist is after. If we just look around, we can see that there are all kinds of reasons for us to praise God. Well, the second section of this psalm begins down in verse number 19. And it's a review of the Davidic covenant, uh, the covenant that God made with David. Uh, really, it's a reminder of how God chose one individual and he established David. He anointed him uh, and made all kinds of promises to him uh, in the covenant. Uh, look at verse 19. Once you've spoken a vision uh, to your faithful people, you said, I have bestowed strength on a warrior. I have exalted a young man from among the people. I found David, my servant, with my sacred oil, I have anointed him. With my hand, I have sustained him. If you just go back and read the life of David in the books of Samuel, you'll, you'll just be amazed at all that God did, even from a little boy as he was out on the battlefield with Goliath, the giant. That wasn't because of David's skill. It wasn't because he had practiced all this stuff, but it was because God was with him. It was because God had chosen him. God had put his hand on David, and uh, David stands head and shoulders above everyone in the Old Testament. God blessed David as a king more than he blessed any other king uh, as far as, well, with any kind of expression. Uh, notice he said in verse 23, I'll crush his fro foes before him and strike down his adversaries. My faithful love will be with him, and through, and through my name, his horn will be exalted. What God is saying is that I'm going to be with David, and he will be the exalted king. He's going to be the one that I uh, hang in there with him. But notice, if you would, verse number 30. If his sons forsake my law, if there's a turning away of the people of David, then if they do not follow my statutes, if they violate my decrees and, fall and fail to keep my commands, I will punish them for their sin with the rod. Now, God had told the people uh, that he was making a covenant with David. And I don't know if you remember, but I have referred several times to Exodus chapter 34 where God identifies himself. And he talks about how he will visit the sins of the fathers to the third and the fourth generation. And we get real disturbed. Why would he do that to three and four generations? Well, just be thankful that it's only three or four generations because, uh, you know, that could go on and on and on. Deuteronomy sort of helps iron some of the wrinkles out of that in that it says that I'm going to do that, but I'll do that to those that hate me. And there are people in this world that just hate God and hate the things of God. And uh, they cannot stand uh, the idea uh, of God doing anything in the world. They don't like the people of God. They don't like people who worship God. And so they really are against God. But anyway, uh, he has made this covenant with David. And now he's saying this covenant 
uh, doesn't prevent me from punishing people who turn away from me, even the followers of David. I mean, if they just feel they can do whatever they want to do and depart from following me, I will punish them from their sin. Now, this doesn't change the covenant, but it does seem to disrupt the promises of the covenant. Uh, let me go ahead and drop on down. I mean, just way on down and uh, look at verse number uh, 49. O oh Lord, where is your former love? Uh, which your faithfulness you swore to David. Remember how your servant has been mocked, how I bear in my heart the taunts of the nation, the taunts with which your enemies have mocked, O oh Lord, and with which they have mocked every step of your anointed one. And then he ends this psalm, verse 52, uh, by saying, Praise be to the Lord forever. Amen and amen. Praise be to the Lord forever. Even though we're having to go through this disruption of what we understand to be the promises of God, we still want these promises uh, to guide us in praising God, even in the most difficult time uh, that we could imagine. I don't know if you were with us last week as we looked at Psalm 88. And by the way, I do need to apologize. We had some technical difficulties last week. We didn't realize until late in uh, what we were doing that the batteries uh, in the little microphone I have, they ran out. And so you saw me talking, but you couldn't hear a word I was saying. Uh, my apologies for that. But Psalm 88, a very difficult psalm because it just really has no good news at all. One of the statements that I made last week one of the scholars said that the most amazing thing about Psalm 78 is that the psalmist even wanted to pray at all. Things were so bad in his life, it was as though there was no ray of life, light coming into his heart. But that is part of the point, that even as difficult as that psalm was, uh, the psalmist was still crying out to God. He knew the only resource he had was to turn to God and to put his faith in God, even though nothing looked good. Well, the psalmist realizes, Psalm 89, realizes there are some great things to look at. Uh, the first section of the book, I mean the psalm up to verse 18, talks about how wonderful God is, and if we look around, there's so much to praise him for. And as far as his interaction with people, beginning in verse 18, he talks about this covenant he's made with David. And it, it is an expression of God's love to mankind, uh, that God would actually make a covenant. Now, things did turn sour, we find in verse 38. Things did not go as man thought they would or as man thought they should. But even in the disruption, we find in verse 52, where he's still praising God. Now, I realize there are many of you. Uh, you have your own struggles. You have your own difficulties. And I pray that your faith will always drive you to praise God, even in the midst of all the horrible things, uh, that you'll praise God for whatever you have, uh, for whatever health you have. Praise God for the health of your family, your loved ones. Uh, praise God for all the great things that he has done for us through Jesus Christ, things he's done for us through the church. And uh, I pray that even in the midst of whatever struggles you may be facing, that you'll continue just to praise God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time together. And Father, I pray that you'll be with each and every individual that uh, watches this opportunity to have this Bible study. And I pray, Lord, you'll use the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart. And may they bring glory and praise to you. And we ask these things now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us. God bless you.